Dick Prouty, um, Chair of Town Green 2025, uh, the nonprofit uh, umbrella really for the Cape Ann Climate Coalition. And this is an initiative of the uh, Community Building and Education Work Group of the Coalition. Um, and Susan Hogue and Lisa Smith and others, Alice, have, uh, have been um, working on this. And we've been looking at school buses, and now we're going to look at transit authorities, and you've uh, gone all the way to electrification. So we're very interested in your story. Um, let me introduce you, Angie Gompert, the general manager of the Martha's Vineyard Transit Authority. Take it all on. right. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see Felicia in person. Uh, Felicia and I have been colleagues now since she started at, at CADA. Um, and two winters ago, we spent a lot of time together in Boston uh, <laughs> at a, a mass dot um, task force, but it's it's been a year since I've seen Felicia. So it's good to see you, Felicia. <laughs> it's good to see you too. <laughs> I'm glad you've got a camera. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so the VTA uh, back in 2016 did an alternative fuels assessment because um, diesel technology on the island was just not working well for us. On the island, our workforce is limited. Um, and just in general, what people call clean diesel vehicles, anything that's been built after 2007, to now, um, just operationally are significantly more difficult to run and due to our limited um, ability to attract skilled um, technicians and all the other fun pieces of getting parts um, quickly on an island, it just didn't make sense for us to keep doing diesel. Um, so I really wanted to take a fresh look at what alternative fuels were out there that would work for us. And based on our service days, because our service days pre-pandemic um, in the summer are, you know, from 5, 5.30 in the morning to 2 in the morning. We run a seven-day-a-week transit system here um, and we carry, you know, 1.3 million passengers a year. But our highs are pretty high. July and August, you're carrying between 300 and 350,000 passengers a month versus, you know, January and February, we're carrying 20 to 25,000 passengers a month. So just with our mileage that we would put on our vehicles, which was about 1.3 million miles a year, I wanted to look differently because we were our downtime was significantly more greater due to all the emissions in diesel vehicles. Ironically, the alternative fuels assessment said we should can stick with diesel um, because CNG is not available on the island, creating our own CNG in terms of transporting it to the island would have been extremely expensive and complicated. Um, we would probably need to bring it over liquefied on a barge and then build our own CNG fueling facility. And um, it was just too much. Uh, we do have propane on the island and there our facility is located in the business park. So I actually have two within a quarter of a mile of our facility, but they don't, we would still need to put in again, propane fueling infrastructure for a full fleet and it's just too slow in fueling and it's also the other issue was is that our um the industry did not make a large propane we have three different bus sizes here 30 feet 35 and 40 feet and the industry was only making the isb which is the smaller engine generally used in a smaller transit vehicle as propane. Um, so that was not gonna work for us because you can't put that size engine in a 40 foot bus and expect it to go anywhere. We had used propane previously. We had purchased two of those back in 99 or 2000. Um, and we specced the range to be 350 miles and we couldn't even get um, 300 miles out of the vehicles. And we also had an acceleration issue. There was just not enough um, pep in the vehicle. And we do a lot of pull-offs and pull-ons because <laughs> part of our island is very rural and part of it is much more like a suburban area. So we frequently stop um, on certain routes and we just couldn't get back into traffic safely. On to electric. Um, after looking at all the options, I 
I just, you know, kept beating my head against the wall and saying, we need to figure out how to make electric vehicles work for us. So the, uh, you know, deciding the technology was the easy part, really, in the relative scheme of things. The rest of it has been extremely time consuming and a ton of work. Um, still worth it, in my opinion, because our performance with our electric vehicles, the, our maintenance costs are way down um, for vehicles. But the problem with the vehicles is that the range is not adequate for our service day. So um, what we have done is we started strategically applying for federal NOLO grants in federal fiscal 17 and have received NOLO grants through MassDOT um, that were awarded by, the, by FTA for the last four years. And that has basically covered the differential cost between a diesel bus and an electric bus for us. Um, the NOLO, we are a rural transit authority. Uh, Cape Ann is not. So our funding is a little bit different than Cape Ann's. But NOLO is a program that was is um, a competitive grant process through FTA. And they just released the fiscal 21 um, NOFO, which is a notice of funding opportunity, and it has a little more flexibility than prior years and a lot more funding available. But um, we've done relatively well with NOLO, I think primarily, to be honest, because um, we're a rural transit authority and there's not too many rurals that are applying for um, NOLO funds because often in rural areas, you might not have the infrastructure necessary that for electrification, meaning that the grid might not be able to support fast charging or um, that the range is strictly just prohibitive based on where the battery technology is in buses today. In the four years we've been doing this, the transit bus industry has come a long way, as has the school bus industry, to be honest. Um, I maintain the school buses on the island, so I'm very familiar with um, the school bus options that are out there. But for us, we have, we went to competitive bid for um, a fleet of buses that we could buy off of for five years for electric um, 30 and 35 footers, because that was what our immediate need was. And we currently have 12 buses in our fleet, eight 35 footers and four 30 footers. And as of June of 21, which is this year, um, we'll be half electric. We'll have four more delivered. So we have a fleet of 32 buses. Um, this has nothing to do with any of the vans that we have, but strictly on the bus side for public transportation, half of our fleet will be electric by then. And we will have all three sizes of buses as well. All three sizes of buses have different battery storage capacities, meaning you can't, so if someone asked, you know, how long does it take a bus to charge? Well, that depends on two things, what type of charging you have and what speed it is, um, and how, how much storage is available on the vehicle, how much energy is on the vehicle available to be stored. So at our office here at 11 A Street, um, we have, we selected BYD as our um, bus manufacturer and they have plug-in chargers for the vehicles that can operate at 40 kilowatts per, um, per hour or, or 80 for two plugs. So we, we procured a charger with every vehicle that we purchased. And in the grand scheme of things, one or two vehicles of charging is negligible. It's not going to have a demand impact in terms of um, demand charges on your utility bill. Once you get over two or three vehicles at charging at 80 kilowatts an hour, that's when you start to see more demand on the utility and what your utility can provide for you um, for available power. So we have Eversource on the island and that's kind of, I don't know what um, is in your region, but Eversource um, has the utility side to this is another whole, probably entirely different conversation and, and, and also a complexity. But um, our charging 
what we decided to do here at the office um, was, which is also where our maintenance facility is, is to set up the infrastructure to be able to charge every vehicle by itself with plug-in charging. And knowing when we decided to go electric, we knew we were gonna require in-route charging in order to make it through the day. Um, so we went out to bid for an inductive, which is in the ground, ch wireless charging for um, two locations on the island at a minimum. And that contract was awarded to BY, uh, excuse me, Momentum Dynamics. On the island, aesthetics matter. So while we could have gone with conductive, which is the overhead charging, um, that would not have gone well because we don't really have a transit center on the island. In our towns where we service, my service area is comprised of six towns on about 100 square miles. We're pulling up next to, on a side road um, in a commercial district, and that's where our bus centers are, our hubs. There's no true transit center um, here. So we're basically in historic areas, and that just would not have been something that we would have ever gotten approved or permitted in any of our towns. So the strategy for us is to, you know, charge the bus and the buses leave here at 100% power. And then as they stop and they dwell, load and unload passengers, they would be picking up a little bit of electricity every time they, they go to these stops. Um, when my board approved us going to electric vehicles and endorse the idea, I went on an island-wide tour to all six towns because each town has a board of selectmen. We don't have any mayors on the vineyard. Um, I went to the Martha's Vineyard Commission, which is our planning agency, which is representative of the full island. And I, you know, we put together a, a PowerPoint presentation of how we were going to achieve electrification. And we were only replacing vehicles as they come due for replacement. We're not purchasing vehicles just to say, okay, we're going to be fully electric. We're, we're paying for, you know, we're just doing it as part of our normal fleet replacement. Um, but I, we made everyone aware that we were going to need to put in inductive charging and everyone was ecstatic about it. That's fantastic. That's great. We're excited. It's green. It's this, it's that. But then it comes down to the, you know, the devils in the details. Well, there's an electrical cabinet and that's not pretty. Um, there's, we're adding battery storage to two of the locations so that we have resiliency um, for charging. And so we've gotten hung up with the inductive charging um, and that is not installed at either of the locations yet. I am going to install one here at base, actually two of them, um, temporarily uh, for this summer because I won't be able to make it through with half of my fleet being all electric. I won't make it through my summer without being able to charge the, the buses quickly during the day. So our, our fast speed, if you will, our, our, our high speed charging is going to be at 150 kilowatts an hour with inductive chargers. With inductive chargers, you can charge up to 300 kilowatts an hour um, depending on how big the battery system in the bus is and what the cooling capabilities are on the vehicles themselves. Our buses um, will be able to charge, could charge at 250 for the 35 and 40 footers, um, but the 30 footers, we would have to step down that. And it just didn't make much sense to have a varied fleet. So we just stuck with 150 kilowatts an hour for our inductive charging and all three vehicle sizes will be able to take that in. Um, and the other part of our project here um, at 11A Street was to um, do a public-private partnership with um, solar. We knew we wanted solar and we wanted to um, not hear the argument of, you know, my, the, you're charging with electricity that's generated from coal, from a power plant, from this, because the vineyard is very, has a lot of opinions on um, climate and green energy and the island is kind of split on that in terms of philosophy. The folks in the Western half of the island are very much believers in, um, climate change and green energy. And on the eastern half of the island, 
there's not as much buy-in, if you will, for that. But for resiliency purposes, for um, operations of the VTA, which ultimately I'm responsible for, I felt that solar was an appropriate means to be able to be independent of the grid. Um, you know, the, the hurricanes in Puerto Rico, we all recall what happened to that island and it was completely devastated. Our island's electricity comes through two underground water cables. And I will say Eversource in the last seven or eight years has been phenomenal with the uptime, but there are many, were many years where just a day like today, we would just lose power for no reason. And here on the island, it's because something happened in Falmouth where the transmission lines came from. So I felt that um, solar was an important piece that we'd be able to generate our own solar directly on site to charge our buses. And so we went out to bid for um, a solar developer to come up with a private public partnership to um, build solar canopies on site that we will. Um, store that energy into batteries that we have also purchased and put on site. So the PV project isn't costing the VTA any money except for technical assistance um, because I'm not an expert in solar. I'm not an expert in um, grid integration and microgridding and islanding. That's not my area of expertise at all. So I have a technical assistance team that we tap for that expertise and that is Vermont Energy Investment Corp. Um, it's, they've been fantastic. They're very varied in their skills and I use them on demand. Um, if I need help with a great application, they'll help with that. If I need them to, you know, the electrical engineer has been hired through them to make all of the stuff outside here work seamlessly. Um, the batteries that we've purchased, because we wanna go be independent of the grid and be able to run and charge and fuel buses when the grid is down. Um, battery storage is fantastic for resiliency, but it's also a little bit more complicated um, because there's not a lot of battery, battery manufacturers in the United States. Um, I couldn't use federal money to buy the batteries because the batteries don't meet the Buy America um, standards, even though I was awarded a grant to buy batteries <laughs> I, I, um, because the technology just doesn't meet the, the thresholds for the Buy America requirements. Um, so we've been navigating that um, and just you know move some funding around, but the batteries are very important, but they're also complex because there's not a lot of vendors out there that allow for grid integration. Many battery, battery manufacturers are um, off for off-grid application. So we've also are building our own microgrid on site so that we can control, um, well, A, the time of fueling the vehicles, if you will, um, because we don't wanna pay demand charges. So we're doing what we're calling smart charging so as far as um, the batteries, um, we, we do have some on site that uh, we'll be using for storage. Um, and the microgrid is the, the main brain, if you will, um, for uh, controlling all of our systems for the bus charging network. Um, in terms of being able to prioritize what needs to be done um, before, you know, in terms of like time of day, um, before other functions that the microgrid and the battery and the PV can provide. There's an income income stream because we're using a public partner private ship, uh, partnership, excuse me, the um, the batteries and the PV are gonna be enrolled um, in demand response type um, programs that should generate um, a little bit of revenue for the VTA. So in addition to having our, um, I think I'm reloading here. Yep, there we go. Um, we'll be able to generate some money and help offset some of the costs, if you will, um, going forward 
for the uh, long-term use of the, our overall infrastructure. And the other benefit to, there we go. Um, the other benefit to what we've done is that we now have a 20 year purchase power agreement um, with a solar developer so that we have our electricity costs less the distribution, I mean, this is the supplier charge um, that we can budget for for the next 20 years because we'll have our cost per kilowatt hour. So that's um, another benefit that for us is that is being able to really control our fuel costs as we proceed to full fleet electrification. Um, let's see. So kind of to go back over it, the, the PV is a public private partnership. The only cost to the VTA has been some technical assistance. Um, there's eight canopies being built that are creating about 440 kilowatts DC and about 650 kilowatts hours of AC um, power on site for on site generation. Our battery storage on site is about 1440 kilowatt hours of storage. Um, and we have a 350 kilowatt diesel generator that's part of our infrastructure for fueling. And um, we currently have 13 bus chargers installed with four more coming. Um, actually, they're here, but we haven't installed them yet. Um, but they'll get done in the next, before the other four buses show up. Um, and we're going to put in temporary inductive charging here um, at our operation center to be able to charge two buses, up to two buses at a time at 150 kilowatts per hour. And then hope that cabinet will hopefully get relocated and we will have three inductive charging um, locations on one street in the town of Edgartown and two in the town of West Tisbury. And the nice part about the inductive charging is, is that the way that we're hoping to do it, it doesn't add to our operating cost, which is while the buses are dwelling, if we do it, the way that we're gonna to have to do it this summer, it's adding to our operating costs because we're swapping out buses all the time. Um, so that's pretty much what we're doing here um, for um, the VTA. Um, my, you know, if, if anybody has any questions about the school buses um, here, um, we can talk about that. Um, the, the one thing that I will say um, is, is, you know, the energy market, you all know being in the climate change, um, coming at it from that angle, is that the energy markets change quite quickly um, in terms of incentives and the ability to turn things into revenue. Um, and what's coming up now is, that's very popular, is, um, you know, energy as a service. There's companies that are creating that energy as a service model versus doing things piecemeal, which is the way the VTA has done it. Um, I wish that energy as a service were, were a, a good option or was even, you know, a little bit more on the, on the table when we started this adventure. Right now we've gone down this road, so we're gonna have to continue down this road because the benefit for someone to come in now is negligible. Um, for us, we are going to look to add additional battery storage here um, at our office at 11A Street. Um, we could reuse the bus batteries um, as storage in time as they age out. Um, our buses were, are, they're all 12 year buses, uh, which are spec for 500,000 miles or 12 years, whichever comes first. We secured a good warranty because we were their first customer on the East Coast. So we have a 12 year warranty on those batteries. And if they ever go below 75%, they do degrade below 25%, um, you know, then they'll replace them. So um, it's not gonna cost us additional money to replace the battery. 
Uh, some of the other transit manufacturers that are out there recommend swapping out the batteries at six years. Um, BYD makes their own batteries, so they're not dealing with somebody else's battery technology. They're doing it themselves. So they're they're backing their product, which is the appropriate thing to do, in my opinion. Um, there are a lot of other bus manufacturers in the game now. Um, it was it was historically just Proterra, and then BYD came in, but now New Flyer is in with a 40 foot bus. Um, Gillig is in with a 30 and 35, no, just a 35. Um, and I think, and, and New Flyer will actually do a 35 too. So I think still the only 30 foot is BYD, um, but that will probably change in a couple of years when Gillig gets more experience with electric vehicles under their belt. And I would assume they would come up with a 30 footer as well. Um, so let's see, um, there's a, do, Dick, how do you want to go on now? Um, do you want to just go to questions? Yeah, I think questions yeah. would be appropriate now. And I'm, I'm just looking at the, uh, chat. Um, I just have a, you know, a sort of mega question. You said you if you if you were starting from fresh now, which of course Cata will, would be if we're just move ahead with Cata, um, you would go to the energy as a service. Is this similar to the, to the um, HET bus model? Probably. Um, I haven't looked at their stuff as much. Um, it's a fixed price, and they take care of everything. You don't you don't have to worry about. It. Yeah, um, there's everything. different ways to set it up. There's um, different, you can set up energy as a service really, really depends on how you procure it. And it was one of the questions um, that actually I had asked yesterday to get some guidance on, I think as this market progresses, is how any federal funds that a transit agency receives, how is that going to be looked at with like that energy as a service model? Because in general, FTA does not approve of leasing and things like that. They prefer the asset to be owned by the authority. And so I think there's gonna be some things that we need to figure out, but I think a procurement that addresses all of the facets ensures um, everything's going to work together in a more smooth fashion. And then you can negotiate into that or as part of that going in, depending on what your model is, whether you're looking at it for school bus, which is a much lower usage. The energy as a service model for a school bus is much more attractive than a transit agency on Martha's Vineyard because mo I roll 28 of my 32 vehicles daily in the summer. So I don't have a lot of available storage there, but school buses, um, as long as they're built to be able to do vehicle to grid, are just a battery that's sitting there all summer long when school's not in session. So it's a much bigger demand response that vehicle, that battery, so that that bus's battery can be deployed back to back to the grid for a response and be a revenue generator for the company that is you know right. whoever the contracts with highland in that case that's what het does during the summer yeah definitely right can, can you the disadvantage to that honestly is that the school bus batteries are significantly smaller in capacity than a transit vehicle so right. there's a pro and a con as with everything one it's an interesting question by bob myers are you intending to use the bus batteries for town resiliency during emergency outages so yeah, so with the town of West Tisbury, they received a clear grant from Mass CEC, and we are hoping to there for them to be able to use during um, a, a, an outage. The problem is, is that it's in a historic area and the batteries are ugly. Um, so we're trying to work through that issue. Um, West Tisbury has three buildings in close proximity to each other the town hall, the council on aging and the library and the library serves as a cooling center and heating center um, in states of emergency. So, and the library is the only roof that could really handle PV and make it worthwhile. And they're also considering a canopy 
in front of the library. Um, so if we can make all of, if we can all play together nicely in the sandbox, the answer is yes. And that's really, in one of my viewpoints as VTA has an impact on our communities that we're in, but we're also a partner. And that if we can partner with them to make a project better for both of us and use you know, the available resources that we all have independently and together to utilize those better, then we should do that. Um, so that's what we're trying to do in West Tisbury. In Edgartown, it's a little bit different. Um, the building that we're next to is called the Visitor Center. And the town owns that building, but they've leased it to the VTA for a dollar. So we're responsible for that building and that's where the public restrooms are. So we will wire that battery to back feed the, that building in the, um, in the event of a power outage because the public restrooms there are, are so busy, but there's no real opportunity to put solar in that area. So a full microgrid in that location really isn't gonna happen because there's just not any space for it. Uh, have a, are you part of it? Green, green aggregation? No, no, no. no. Yeah, I think Cape Cod. I think Cape Cod has that, but you're not a part of that, right? Right. The right. The there is Cape and Vineyard Electric Collaborative that is doing more, um, but our rate actually by going out independently was better than what they could offer. But we are buying some surplus net metering credits from some towns that have some right now. Okay. Um, are you intending to go? You're not electric in school now, are you? School buses now? Electric school buses. School buses are not electric here. Our school district switched from diesel because they also saw how expensive their maintenance bills were to gasoline school buses, um, and they've replaced. Uh, they have six out of 23 remaining diesel. The rest, the other, all the rest are gasoline, either that they leased or they purchased. And the cost difference between gasoline and electric is about $280,000 a bus um, for the Bluebird electric school buses. Massachusetts has a state bid for school buses. And so they're the Bluebird school buses um, and they don't, they did get some VW money to off. They went, you know, I helped them do a, a grant to apply for the differential cost for two buses. Um, they're, it's going to town meetings here for the local portion of that this spring. So I'm hoping that they go with at least two electric school buses, but they have not gone. Um, there's nobody really championing the electrification at the school district and everybody there in school district's defense there in the, this pandemic has really stretched school districts across the country in ways that they haven't, you know, been stretched before. So you need somebody that's going to champion the project and they just don't have it. They run their own transportation. It is not run by like a first student. So, um, okay. Yep. And paying for the buses. So I, I don't know. I'm, I don't know if they're going to proceed. I would love for them to proceed, but I don't know if they're going to. Um, how do you deal with uh, keeping the buses warm in the winter? So um, that is a challenge in the Northeast. And I keep harping at anybody that will listen that the industry needs to make strides in that and push back on the bus manufacturers. Um, there are a couple options. Um, we're using or, or trying to get working, I'll rephrase that, a preheating logic so that a timer essentially will go on 15 minutes before the bus is slated to go out to heat the bus so it's not drawing from the bus's battery so that it'll draw from the grid at that point in time. Um, you can put in a diesel auxiliary heater. I chose not to. Um, again, I didn't need anything else to maintain here. So um, I'm, heard yesterday that they are finally um thermo king has a heat pump installation for transit buses that are being used in the uk and i hear that that is now going to is being pushed over to the united states and that's 
that's that's about the most encouraging thing I've heard in a long time um, about heating vehicles in the Northeast uh, for especially the electric ones. Um, propane I've also heard is coming in as another auxiliary heater. Um, but I personally didn't think that that was a fantastic idea. Um, but I think that the industry has to rethink how they heat the vehicles. There is heat generated on that vehicle. Um, and they could capture that even at a lower level, say through a radiant heating um, to go through different areas because it is a real problem for us in the Northeast. We can use 20 kilowatts of energy an hour strictly heating the vehicle. And on my 30 footers, I only have 180 kilowatts of storage. And we try to run them down to um, the lowest 20%. So say we have about 150 usable kilowatts of energy on that vehicle. The bus is out there for five hours and it has to come back because we don't have enough capacity on there. Um, and that's why the inductive charging is so important because at every stop that vehicle would get a little bit more, you know, it might get five to 10 kilowatts of energy every time it stops at that location and that will make it last through the day. So you you know Felicia well, and what would you say if we were if they were to cons if we were to consider uh, going down the electric transport route now? That you, have, that you have to have buy-in. Um, it, it's not an easy process, so everybody has to understand that. Um, we didn't even touch on the utility challenges, and those are many. Um, but you have to get buy-in from everybody in your organization. Um, that's pretty much the, the bigger issue, um, I think, for some transit systems. Um, you mean- you, I have some friends- talking about, talking about the drivers or who, who are you talking about? Um, your operating staff, your operating company, your mechanics and the drivers. The drivers impact the ability, the, the performance of that vehicle immensely. If um, if they are heavy on the acceleration, if they don't allow for enough regenerative braking time, um, you can, the nice part about electric buses is, is that they are programmable depending on the logic of the manufacturer. But most vehicles now are you use some form of multiplex wiring, which means that there's parameters that can be set. So we, I set our parameters to not exceed I've actually just lowered it on these next four buses, um, maximum speed of 45 miles per hour and the maximum acceleration of between zero and 15 um, is within uh, four or five seconds. So that you're not, because electric vehicles are very peppy for those of you that have driven one, but the more energy you use on takeoff, the less energy you have available throughout the day. And we do so many pull-offs and pull-ons that we needed to, to control what we could to make the vehicles last as long as they will. Um, the, we are getting, um, we're driving them pretty efficiently overall. I have some efficiency statistics. If anybody wants to take a look at those, I could send those over. But overall, we're getting, we're getting what the manufacturer has stated is the usable range um, for the vehicles when we drive them, not in the winter, but in the summer under normal HVAC, you know, when you're got your air conditioning going in the spring and fall, we're doing fine with meeting the stated range on the vehicle, but you never run it down to the stated range because then you're stranded. <laughs> so our operating practice is to not run it down below 20%, um, but we get notifications because we do run it down to 15% and then 10%, and then I start getting nervous. Um, we, we get notified when the vehicle's state of charge is that low. And it's usually when it's coming back. Is your, if you look at where you were from a, from a cost basis economic model, has this transition ended up with you in a better economic place, a similar or more expensive? Um, all three. So for my operating costs, the maintenance cost has gone down. 
Yes, and the I was fuel wondering costs. The, the, the people who used to maintain, all those people who are maintaining all those fossil fuel engines, they're no longer necessary. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a right. rip. that's a reduction in force right there. It is and it isn't because the PM interval on electric buses is more frequent, but it, the time is spent doing inspections um, and clearing off connectors, if you will. You nice. know, you're not in there changing oil and you're not paying for oil and you're not paying for getting rid of oil, but you're paying the labor to go through and inspect the vehicle to make sure that all the connections are dust free. And, you know, um, you're still going to go through tires. You're still going to, you know, have your nor your normal wear items, but your filters, and there are obviously HVAC filters that we're changing, changing much more frequently now, but um, there are still, there are cost savings though in, in maintenance. You're not replacing a diesel particulate filter every year. You're not doing injectors every other year or at every 50 or 60,000 miles, which is what we're doing now. Um, electricity is, some months we do fantastic. <laughs> um, sometimes we, when we first started, uh, diesel was, we were paying about $3 a gallon for diesel. So we did quite well on um, saving money on our fuel cost. But as my, the solar canopies and the battery storage unit should have been done over a year ago. But, you know, between the pandemic and just normal delays, we're there they'll be finished up by april um we're now electric electricity is actually costing us more right now than diesel is one is because i was able to buy diesel at a steal at a dollar 59 a gallon when the pandemic started i pre-bought a hundred thousand gallons worth of diesel so you know i've got this ridiculously low price for diesel and we're also because we don't have enough infrastructure and we're not using the batteries yet, we're paying demand charges at certain times of the year, um, usually every month, but it just changes at certain times of the year. So in the summer, when the buses come back, we're still in demand charge mode and we still need to top them off so we can get a few more hours out of them at night. Um, and then in the winter, they're coming back in the middle of the day and then they charge them and they're not quite done when, um, the winter demand charge time for the vineyards kicks in at four o'clock. So if they're not done charging by four o'clock and we get more than two buses plugged in, then we're going to get hit with demand charges. So um, on the operating side, once we get our demand charges in control under control, we'll be spending less money. But on the capital side, you're spending more money yeah. up front. Um, I do have a handy dandy tool um, that California, I think it was CalStart, um, came up with the cost of, uh, uh, I've got one too many windows open here. I have four screens, so I look around a lot. <laughs> not that I'm not trying to make eye contact, I just look around a lot. Um, so I have, a, and I'll email this to Felicia. Um, it is, a tool that they came up with for um, costing out. And Firefox doesn't want to do its thing right now. Um, for costing out, uh, here we go. Basically, the cost of ownership estimator, if you will, is what they call the tool. Um, for electric vehicles and you put in the type of vehicle you're replacing. And they, this tool can actually be used for school buses. Um, I sent this to our school district and they realized that the cost of ownership was gonna be more expensive for electric. So this tool is pretty handy. It's obviously not exact, it's free. So it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to be exact, but um, I'm gonna send this to Felicia and she can share this. Um, everybody that wants it. Great. So we got about five more minutes. Are there any final questions? We'll wrap it up at 11. Could I throw in one? Certainly. 
I wanted to know a little bit more about the induction charging uh, stations that you had mentioned. Um, you know, what what powers those and how are they used with your, your buses? Uh, they are also charged straight from the grid. Yeah, that's how they're powered. Mm -hmm. When they're here for the temporary infrastructure, they'll be, they're, we're putting them into our microgrid so that they'll be used primarily from the battery during the day because we're going to need it more in the summer than we are in the winter. Um, and summer demand charges for us is 9 to 6, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. So, um, you know, that's what we're going to use them for. So it's just electricity. And does does the bus have to stay at the induction charger for a while, or is there a sort of an instant recharge that is a result? Um, it's not instant. It's based on how fast the or how much power you're putting in. So we're putting them in at 150 kilowatts an hour. So if it's sat there for an hour, they're at about 93 or 94 percent efficient. You'd be getting about 140-ish kilowatts, if you will, of energy if it's sat there for an hour. Um, the bus does need to be equipped with induction charging plates and the bus squats. So the bus is normally kneel to let folks on that can't quite make that first step. Um, so the bus squats over the inductive chargers and begins charging after the driver hits the button. The handshake between the bus and the charger takes about 30 seconds. Um, so our buses dwell on Church Street for anywhere between five and 12 minutes. So we're expecting them to get about 13 to 14 kilowatts of energy on every trip that they get in there. Hmm. And they hit that, some buses hit that every hour. Some buses hit it about every hour and 15 to every hour and 30 minutes. My South Beach buses actually hit it every half hour. And then the other route that comes in there, they cycle in there every three hours. Wow, it's a complicated dance. I have one final question, I guess. Um, is there any, do you have any uh, data or opinion polls or anything else about how people like the the uh, clean air better than the diesel fuels in certain neighborhoods? Is that something that's been noticed? Um, nothing formal, just, you know, anecdotes. Um, yeah. Overall, they're a joy. My office is on the second floor of our building is, you know, a pre-manufactured metal building. And I'm on the second floor in the corner and the CDL training course is right outside my window. And the exhaust for our diesel buses is driver side up high in the back. So it's noisy. Um, I, the, but when the electric buses are out there for, all you hear is just the tires on the street. They're just a delay. And you can hear the HVAC. Don't get me wrong, they're not completely quiet. You mm -hmm. can hear the HVAC unit in when it's really hot and humid here, which we get, you know, we get that, you know, the with the water around us like you guys do, the humidity is probably worse than the heat, honestly. Um, so they really kick in with the H uh, the cooling system that they put in on our second generation of buses is a little bit louder, which I wasn't thrilled about. But it's when you're down at street level, it's a delight. <laughs> it's it's really nice. Um, so um, I did see a couple other questions here. Dick, I don't know if you want me to answer any of those. Well, yeah, I, there's, we didn't get, to, go ahead, if you've got time. Um, so the buses range from my 30 footers, I get about 150 uh, miles out of, if they're driving conservatively, um, my 35, and this is summertime, this is not winter operation. And uh, my 35 footers, we get about 180, 185 miles out of. Um, the drivers like the electric buses much better um, because they're, they're not, they don't break down <laughs> nearly as much as the diesels. They're not as loud. Uh, they're not trying to talk over the noise. The drivers like them quite a bit. Solar panels on buses, not yet. I wouldn't be surprised if we see some kind of solar film in time as a means of continuing, but then you would have to have more inverters and things like that on the vehicles to convert that power to go straight into 
uh, the batteries. And that's not as simple as it sounds. Yeah. Um, the community overall really likes them though. Um, I'm trying to get the school district to get the kids involved, the high school. They have a um, basically an honors class where they can kind of pick their own projects as their seniors. And I was hoping that they would do more um, on the electrification and understand the impacts of the greenhouse gases and the acidification. Ooh, that's a pretty good word for me <laughs> um, on the ocean because of, you know, yeah. we don't have, we don't, you know, we're, we're not a CMAC um, clean air, you know, hotspot, you know, but we get, because, so we're not in a, um, a zone for CMAC, but we get all the, the winds from Fall River, New Bedford, Providence. And then, so the air quality and the asthma rates and things like that on the vineyard are extremely high. So um, even though our containment area is, we're not in a containment area, the impacts of other containment areas really impact us. Yeah. yeah. Um, we used to have that here with the Salem power plant, but fortunately that's gotten a lot better. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, it's there was one other question here about hydrogen fuel cells. Um, yeah. They are available, they're getting better, but I still think they're a ways off. They're kind of cool. I've, if, if I get bored after electrification, I wouldn't mind trying to retrofit one of our older vehicles, but they're still a ways off and just the tank capacity um, is good. But if you're doing the newest hybrid ones, um, the hydrogen cell fuels, there, I know there are folks in California that really do enjoy those, but um, that was not gonna work initially for us. So we heard when we had the presentation from the HET owner, that question was we had about five or ten minutes on that. And basically he thinks everything's changing very quickly, but he thinks it'll be about 2030 before that gets to be competitive pricing. Yeah. yeah. They got a ways to go. And 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 I think you're gonna see in the next five years um a, a really solid effort to change more of um the batteries on transit and i also think you'll see some charging much more charging charging flexibility which does not exist right now mm -hmm. if i bought a new flyer bus and a byd bus and a proterra bus all three charge differently they don't share the same plug and that's just not okay um, so i think you'll see the level three chargers that are getting put in certain areas throughout the country really gain traction and that there'll be more universal charging protocols um, so that we can impact more industries, FedEx, UPS, all of those. Um, and that Electrify America is definitely working towards that. And I think with this administration in Washington, we'll probably see a lot more progress with that as well. Standardization is a big deal. Yep. Yep. It's well, huge. thank you uh, so Dick, much. This is Dick. This is Valerie, if I could throw one last question in. 11.05, so. Yeah, okay. No, this is just about the induction facilities. I showed the newspaper article about that to um, an engineer and he said he predicted there'd be a lot of complaints from people who resist electromagnetic currents and damage to the human body and all that. Have you heard any of that? Like those big high current um, putting near people? Um, yeah. And, I've I've heard a lot of various things, um, but you got to dig down into the details. The the chargers that we're looking at are no, they're actually less um, of a magnetic field than a microwave. So it's less than a cell phone. So it's the higher the power, the more of the issue. But again, it's all in the grand scheme of relative. Um, it's just a matter because they all have to meet. There's a lot of acronyms that I can't remember, but there's a lot of compliance required in order to get certified. And there's all these different things that they have to meet in order to not have the impacts. The early, early, early elect induction chargers um, and conductive, quite frankly, back in the early 2000s, they were problematic, but they stomped on that pretty quickly. Terrific. Thank you so much, Angie. And this has been very helpful. and. Um... Thanks everybody for attending and the CBE work group will be looking at this and coming out with some thoughts, I'm sure. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you.